This program is made possible by a grant from the Kugelman Foundation. This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Bill Harrell and welcome to Inside Healthcare. Our topic tonight is medical technology, promising cancer treatments, life-saving surgical procedures, and pharmacological breakthroughs have been pioneered in the United States. America's medical technology ranks with the best in the world. However, medical technology is expensive and contributed to the rising costs of healthcare. We'll discuss these issues tonight at this town hall meeting located at the Gene and Paul Amos Performance Studio on the campus of Pensacola Junior College. Stay with us as we explore medical technology, its cost, and what's available in our area. We've got a great panel tonight, and joining us is Dr. William Bailey. He's a thoracic surgeon with Cardiology Consultants, and welcome, Dr. Bailey. Thank Glad you, you could be with us tonight. Also with us is Sid Cardina, and she's Vice President of Clinical Services for Baptist Hospital. Welcome. Thank you. Also joining us is Dr. Emmanuel Gilmore. She's Associate Director for Exenda. And also joining us is Dr. Harish Mahaltra. He's a medical oncologist with the Sacred Heart Medical Oncology Group. From Gulf Shores, Alabama, joining us is Dr. Galen McCullough. He's a facial plastic surgeon with the McCullough Institute for Appearance and Health. And also joining us is Dr. Paula Montgomery, retired medical director for Covenant Hospice. And finally joining us is Todd Torgerson, the president of Combined Insurance Services. Thank you all very much for being with us tonight. We do appreciate you coming out and being part of this panel. Well, Dr. Gilmore, we uh, have seen that uh, medical technology takes all sorts of shapes. It can be a diagnostic equipment, it can be medicine, it can be surgical procedures, it can even be a new way we keep up with medical records. How would you define medical technology in your world? In my world, um, as an economist, I actually have a, a pretty uh, clear definition of what uh, medical technology is, and I think that it's a good or a service in our healthcare system that adheres to or, or includes three different components, one of which is some degree of basic research, some degree of testability, and some degree of ultimately marketability, which means the capability of being reimbursed in our healthcare system. Is it always considered medical technology better than what was there before? No, absolutely not. In fact, um, in a lot of different uh, arenas, whether it be you know pharmaceutical products or, or diagnostics, um, other types of modalities, there is no um, prerequisite that uh, medical technology prove itself better than its comparators before it's allowed to be on the market and ultimately accessible by patients. Now, I want to talk about uh, the role um, as far as rising health care in the U.S. You know, we've all seen the figures, you know, 2.3 trillion a year and, you know, a huge amount of our uh, gross domestic product. You know, it's even getting up there to be a sixth of our economy. Um, what role does medical technology play in this rising cost of health care, which doesn't seem to be stopping? Medical technology plays a huge role. Um, there, there's a lot of, of course, discussion and discourse around exactly what role it plays. But um, a, to a large degree in the past decade or two decades, um, most experts would agree that medical technology in the U.S. has really spurred the growth um, from 10 percent or so of our GDP to what we now see in 16 or 17 percent. And it's not always just new medical technologies. It's also um, just increased use of existing medical technologies, which uh, follows the payment mechanisms and other reimbursement structures that we have. Well, I appreciate you uh, jumping in there. Does anybody else have anything to say about medical technology at this point? Any, any thoughts? Well, Dr. Bailey, I wanted to uh, talk off with you because um, you deal with uh, the number one killer you know, in the U.S., and that's heart disease. And um, I was looking back, and let's take 25 years. You know, what do you see that's happened in the last 25 years that's really helped people in their fight against heart disease? Well, I think to really get a, a good idea of how cardiac surgery and cardiology has evolved, we need to go back slightly further. Really the beginning of uh, modern day cardiology and cardiac surgery really began around 1960. And that was when uh, angi angiograms were developed by Soans and Shirley. They developed a technique to thread a catheter into the heart and inject the coronary arteries. 
And from a cardiac surgery standpoint, that's when the heart-lung machine was developed around that same time, and people started performing bypass surgery with a heart that was arrested and, and still without any blood present. But really, in the past 25 years, those techniques have been improved upon, obviously, with evolving technology. But drug-looting stents from a cardiology standpoint has been a big issue that's developed in the past 25 years. These are uh, stents that can be placed in blocked coronary arteries that uh, hold them open, and because of the drug-looting uh, technology, they don't uh, stenose quite as quickly as the non-drug-looting stents were. From a cardiac surgery standpoint, there's a myriad of new techniques that uh, make cardiac surgery uh, more effective, safer, quicker return to work. Uh, some of which are off-pump uh, heart surgery where we do not arrest the heart because there's uh, devices available to help stabilize the heart in a local, uh, local position, uh, stabilize the coronary artery so that we can sew it while the heart is beating. Other technologies are surgeries to treat atrial fibrillation, which is a common uh, cardiac uh, rhythm that affects probably 10% of the population in general. Uh, and then finally, minimally invasive techniques, uh, either small incision or totally port access uh, incisions or port access surgery has developed really over the past 10 to 15 years. Uh, surgeons in general are very conservative, so any technology that comes along typically takes 10 to 15 years to develop and to be used in a community setting, but we offer all those technologies here in Pensacola. I'll tell you a story. My, um Grandmother on my mother's side uh, died when she was 59 years old and she died of heart disease and she had had four or five heart attacks and her treatment was pretty much non-treatment. In other words, there was, they kept her in a, a unit and, mm -hmm. and I guess gave her a lot of rest and, and some medication and that type of thing, hoping that she would improve. But my mother on um, March 21st celebrated her 89th birthday and she's lo lived longer than anyone in her family has ever lived. And at certain moments in time, uh, she has had cardiac um, incidents, and uh, she, she keeps on going, like the Ever Ready battery. So, you know, it's once again, um, uh, this is a medical technology that's really uh, helped people, like my mother, you know, keep, keep mm -hmm. going. Uh, heart attacks is something that, you know, happens to a lot of people. Uh, since the 80s, it, it used to be that a lot of times they were treated with, with medicines, but now very aggressive um, uh, uh, treatment when, when they come in through complaining about chest pain and that type of thing. Absolutely. What's going on there? Well, uh, that's primarily the role of the cardiologist and not the cardiac surgeon. We try not to treat heart attacks in the acute moment because it does take a while to mobilize an operating room. And the goal there is to establish blood flow to that part of the heart that's having a heart attack as quickly as possible. And that's where the cardiologists come in. We practice a door to balloon time where we try to uh, get the patient in the cath lab and have a balloon in that artery within 60 minutes of arrival to the hospital and, and we know that that improves outcome. The less muscle lost in that heart attack, the better the person's going to do long term. And finally with cardiac surgery, you, you alluded to some of this, but um, I wanted to, uh, to talk about, you mentioned the, um, the heart-lung machine, the pump, and um, is, is that being used less today and is the heart actually beating when you perform the coronary bypass surgery? It's part of it is surgeon preference. Part of it is uh, comorbid conditions that that patient might have. There's been no long-term studies that have shown that beating heart surgery is any safer than surgery with a bypass machine. Although, as a surgeon, I know that I've prevented major complications by not using the, the bypass machine, and I think most of us in this community practice that way. We selectively use cardiopulmonary bypass to do our cases or we selectively use off-pump techniques for our cases. Uh, I did two cases today, both of them were beating heart surgery. It's just a matter of which works best for that patient at that time. Well, we had an opportunity um, to visit a, a new cancer center. It's a $32 million uh, facility that's just been built at Sacred Heart in Pensacola. and. Um, you know, cancer, once again, is an, a killer in, in the United States. And um, let's take a look at this new cancer center. I think you all will see uh, just what it looks like. It's uh, got 95,000 square feet, and it costs $32 million to build. So let's, let's take a look at it, and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about it later. A new facility has opened on the campus of Sacred Heart Hospital in Pensacola. 
It offers medical technology and support services under one roof to diagnose and treat cancer. We saw the need for a new cancer center um, because our cancer services were not consolidated in one location and were not very convenient for our patients. Um, the new cancer center also allows for our practitioners, our physicians, to work together um, very smoothly on the care of patients. Another significant advantage for patients is that this really puts all of our care for patients in one location. We are attached to all of our diagnostic services for patients as well as um, all of the treatment services are in one location and very conveniently available. Um, we have our chemotherapy area, our radiation, and then all of our supportive services for cancer care are located right here. The 95,000 square foot facility offers an outpatient chemotherapy unit area with private, semi-private, and group treatment areas. Our chemotherapy area was really designed with patients in mind, with enough privacy, but also some open bay areas where patients who desire to talk with their neighbor um, can also do that. We have 32 chemotherapy chairs and five private rooms that have beds. So if a patient is not feeling well, we also have a place for them to lie down. And we have um, a beautiful chair that actually has um, heat and massage and is um, very comfortable for the patient, but also functional for the nurse to care for the patient. The treatment of cancer with chemotherapy drugs has changed dramatically over the past 25 years. I've been an oncology nurse for about 25 years and um, I can remember the days when cancer patients were typically treated in an inpatient environment. And the reason that we did that is that patients got so sick that they couldn't really be treated as outpatients. Where today we have drugs that are much better at controlling nausea and vomiting, that are controlling the um, low blood counts of our patients, that we're able to support them through therapy so that they can get the right dose at the right time um, that really impacts patients. You know, today it's not uncommon for patients to come on a Friday to, for their chemotherapy and be back to work on Monday. We have come a long way. Cancer care, in some cases, has become a chronic illness, not an acute illness. And we have second line, third line, fourth line therapies um, to provide to those patients. The four-story facility also provides a radiation oncology unit that uses the Trilogy Stereotactic System to precisely pinpoint and treat cancerous tumors. The radiation oncology area in our cancer center has really improved. Our Trilogy um, unit is our, the state-of-the-art radiation oncology equipment that really allows for the most minimal side effects for patients. We really are able to design the radiation so that it really is conformed only to the tumor um, and really benefits um, patients from a side effect perspective. Sacred Heart is affiliated with the MD Anderson Network. Cancer patients gain access to guidelines and quality initiatives developed by teams of specialists at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. We have been affiliated with the nation's leader in cancer care, MD Anderson, for about four years. And what that affiliation means to the care of our patients is quite significant. Um, first of all, um, MD Anderson um, has to credential all of our physicians that are in our affiliate network. Um, that means that they look at the care that those physicians have provided um, to make certain that it is at a level that MD Anderson wants it. MD Anderson has research-based guidelines for care that are best practices in the country. They also come and review our facilities, not just the physical structure, but all of our processes. We also have regular tumor boards with MD Anderson, meaning that they are able to present cases to MD Anderson experts and to get their input in care to also understand if MD Anderson has leading research that might help um, this particular patient. Um, we then can send a patient to MD Anderson um, for part of their care and then they can come back locally for the rest of their care. The $32 million facility also offers lab and pharmacy services and a cancer research staff. We also have a variety of support services. We have social workers on site, 
We have our MD Anderson coordinator who really coordinates care um, over back and forth to MD Anderson. We've also partnered with the American Cancer Society, so we have a gift closet for patients where they can get a free wig, a turban, um, a prosthesis if that's needed, um, and really a lot of information from the American Cancer Society. This is a center that is dedicated to doing nothing but caring for cancer patients. Whether it is the person at the front desk, whether it is the nurse who's giving chemotherapy, whether it's the tech, whether it's the physician providing the care, that's what we're here to do, is provide cancer care. Well, Dr. Mahaltra, we've just seen a new cancer center at Sacred Heart, and one of the advantages is all of the cancer services are under one roof. Um, how does that work with uh, physicians and being able to explore the medical technology? When a patient is diagnosed with cancer, it's probably the most stressful time in their life and uh, their family's life. And to have all the services consolidated in, in one building just makes life a lot easier for them. Instead of going from one place to another and having to make appointments, they are all in one building. It makes it easier for the physicians also, medical oncologists and the radiation therapists. They can talk to each other, quickly confer, go into a conference room, have video satellite uh, hookups with MD Anderson, and uh, map out a treatment plan for the patient. So it just, it's, it's the whole building was designed with convenience for the patient in mind. And you've been practicing medical oncology for over 30 years now. And, years. and, and what do you see are, are the advances that have been made in the treatment of cancer from, from your perspective? Just explosive. The, the advances have been just explosive. Both um, the, the way to treat cancer, um, um, it's broken into radiation therapy, chemotherapy. And then there's a whole field now which is called targeted therapy. And as the years go by, um, you're going to hear the buzzwords are going to be targeted therapy individualized therapy, tailored therapy towards an individual tumor and so forth, because the advances are just too many. Even in the field of hormonal therapy, the advances are just uh, too many to sum up in a few minutes. Um, for instance, uh, what, what we do now with the cancer cell, not just uh, throw toxic chemotherapy at the patient, we study the cancer cell in great detail at the genetic level, chromosomal level. We study the surface of the cancer cell with receptors we try to develop monoclonal antibodies to those cancer cells. And these are not chemotherapy drugs. They're not toxic. They don't cause nausea, vomiting, hair loss, and the traditional toxicities of uh, chemotherapy drugs. So the advances are just too many, and they're just very, the patients are very grateful. Uh, and the results are uh, incredibly positive. Well, thank you, Will. We've heard uh, about heart and cancer. And uh, back to you, Dr. Gilmore. Um, you work with insurance companies. Um, what are they looking for when you talk about new medical technology, meaning uh, reimbursement issues. What, what are they looking at? They're looking at several things. It, it really depends on it depends on the the disease area. Um, it depends on how novel the technology is. If it is a, offering a superior benefit, uh, traditionally, I would uh, I would say that they're usually looking at um, nothing more than that in terms of. Of the fact that they're going to cover um, cover that and allow patients access to it, if it's a little muddier in terms of of the actual superior benefit of the medical technology, um, either in terms of its safety or or its therapeutic advantage to a patient, then they start to start to look at more of the cost effectiveness of of the actual agent in terms of of starting to uh, pay a little more mindfulness to its actual cost relative to its benefit for for the average patient, um, generally speaking. Well, Todd, uh, you represent the insurance industry, and thank you for being here. Not and I right. uh, wanted to ask you about um, a lot of people when they um, maybe get sick, they, they go to their policy, and, and when do the insurance companies really decide what new medical technology should be covered? When, when is that decision made that all of a sudden something that may be considered experimental is no longer experimental but becomes part of a, a large group of policies? Yeah. Well, like any great decisions, they're borne by committee at the insurance companies. And um, they don't do it all at the same time. They, they operate, I believe, similarly, but they don't do it all together. And, but they do make decisions by committees. Um, like she was saying, they look at the cost benefit. Uh, they're really looking for evidence-based uh, information on the, the procedure or the drug or whatever it may be. And, 
uh, when they conclude that it's, that it's safe, uh, that it's uh, cost effective, that they're not replacing another procedure that could in fact um, have done it, done the same thing but done it less expensively, that's when they start to move forward. And, and again, it's not like a, a light switch that, that goes off for all the insurance companies at one time. You may see a, a Blue Cross Blue Shield behave differently than a United Healthcare versus an Aetna, uh, just depending on the insurance company and their outlook on the issue is going to drive their decisions. Well, I know day to day you deal with, um, with, with people talking about insurance plans and that type of thing. And do you find uh, in your experience that a lot of people never really sit down and read what's in their insurance policy so if they do get sick, they don't know if it's covered or not? I mean, almost to the point that they don't even do it until they get sick. Well, clearly the people that know about their insurance policies are the ones that use it the most frequently. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like around here during, uh, after the Hurricane Ivan swept through, uh, a lot of people found out how their homeowner's policies worked because they'd never used them before, but they attempted to use them once the hurricane had passed and they found out things that were covered and things that weren't. And that's pretty much how the medical business works too. It's a little higher frequency use, fortunately, than, than homeowners. A lot more people understand it. As we age, we tend to need medical services more. So the older we get, the more we tend to know about our policies. Okay. Well, I appreciate you uh, coming out and telling us more. We'll talk a little bit more about insurance. But uh, Dr. McCullough, we've uh, got to talk with you a little bit about um, uh, really facial plastic and reconstructive surgery and, and what you've seen over the past 25 years. Now, Typically, um, with facial plastics, it's not covered by insurance, but reconstructive is. And, and, and when you look at advances, what do you see are some of the major things that have entered your field? Well, I think that plastic surgery falls into the arena of wellness. And we've talked a lot tonight about illness, uh, chronic disease, end-stage disease. And really, the industry that I'm involved in is, imp is there to improve the quality of life while one is healthy and well. And I, we don't operate on patients that are extremely ill. We make sure that the patients are in good health before we take them into the operating room and do plastic surgery. I think the greatest changes, though, that have occurred in the plastic surgery arena, number one is there's more outpatient surgery, and it's done now in certified uh, outpatient facilities, which reduces the cost. And we talk a lot about technology and technology driving the cost up, and we see that in our field as well. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of the new things that occur in plastic surgery are not better than the ones that have been around for many, many years. A lot of the minimally invasive and non-invasive procedures end up costing much more than the surgery itself. If people really look at it, what it costs them to go have multiple injections and other minor procedures over an extended period of time, they'll end up seeing that they paid a lot more than they would had they had a definitive operation. So we are, we're excited in this field about some of the new things that are coming along, but it takes about five to seven years before you really know whether a procedure is better than the one that's there. So my advice to people is to go slowly, uh, ask good questions, ask questions of the doctor about his or her experience, how long he or she's been using uh, a new technology, and how many procedures that he or she has actually done before they get in a chair or lie down on an operating room table and have some of those procedures done. I want to talk a little bit about the reconstructive side of, of, of your, your practice. Um, you've seen everything from dog bites to you know, people that hit windshields to just uh, horses kicking people you know, and that type of thing. Um, on the reconstructive side, you know, is this something that uh, has, has changed? Are you able to uh, to, to treat people better today than you did 30 or 40 years ago when you first started? I think we are. We don't see the exact same type, well, we don't see the same type of injuries today that we did 30 to 40 years ago. Seat belts have made a huge difference in terms of head injuries and facial injuries from automobile accidents. But uh, some of the newer suture techniques, some of the newer wound closure materials, uh, having patients on antibiotics, better wound care, better immediate care in the emergency rooms, have made uh, reconstructive surgery from trauma a great deal better. Uh, we also are seeing congenital deformities at an earlier age, and I think some of the new technology with implants and grafts uh, that are coming out of experimental laboratories may be promising in the future, but there are ways off yet. 
Well, thank you. We're hearing a lot about robotic surgery, and this is um, something that uh, is getting a lot of attention. And we had a chance to visit two hospitals in the Pensacola area, and they're actually uh, using the Da Vinci surgical system. And now let's roll the tape and learn more about robotic surgery. New medical technology is being used in operating rooms at Baptist and West Florida hospitals in Pensacola. It's called robotic surgery, utilizing the Da Vinci surgical system. The system consists of a surgeon's console, a patient cart with four interactive robotic arms, a high performance vision system, and patented instruments. What I tell patients is that, that robotic surgery is simply an extension of laparoscopic surgeries. Again, using the scopes and the cameras through very small incisions, less than a quarter inch oftentimes, uh, to do the surgery. The robot is not the robot as we know it, the robot that would say build a car where somebody presses a button and says, screw in the screw. Now, the robot as it is only does exactly what I direct it to do. The instruments are wristed, and what I mean by that is now I have the exact same dexterity, if not even more so, of doing surgery with the robotic arms as I would if I was doing the surgery with my own hands inside the belly, as opposed to doing traditional laparoscopic surgery where the instruments are very rigid. The system replicates the surgeon's movements in real time. It cannot be programmed, nor can it make decisions on its own to move the surgical instruments. It's designed to help surgeons perform complex, minimally invasive surgery. The surgery that I do mostly is called a sacrocopalpexy, and that's where we repair a vaginal prolapse or do vaginal reconstruction using uh, the Da Vinci system. We also do uh, general gynecologic work as well as far as hysterectomies, myomectomies where we just remove fibroids and that way the women can still keep their uterus um, as well as complex surgeries uh, that include endometriosis or severe pelvic adhesions. Approximately one in six men in the United States over the course of their lifetime will develop prostate cancer. One of the main treatments for that is radical prostatectomy or removal of the entire prostate for prostate cancer. It's fortunate that we can do that robotically and laparoscopically and in a minimally invasive fashion. In the United States, right now in 2010, we project that we'll be doing 80% of radical prostatectomies robotically. I've really taken an interest in doing procedures other than prostatectomy, mainly kidney work, nephrectomy, partial nephrectomy, and then also uh, bladder cancer work, cystectomy, which I'm happy to say we're doing here at Baptist and not many people in the entire southeast are doing that type of work. The surgeon operates while seated comfortably, viewing a highly magnified 3D image of the body's interior. To operate, the surgeon uses master controls that work like forceps. As the surgeon manipulates the controls, the system responds in real time, translating the surgeon's hand, wrist, and finger movements into precise movements of miniaturized instruments at the patient side cart. Now you can see here, you know, this is obviously a, a demonstration that we've been using. If we're dealing with a, a real patient, the patient would be lying on the, on the uh, operative table this way. Typically the head is up going to be by uh, where the uh, anesthesia cart is. Uh, and then the patient's abdomen would be around here. Once we get the ports placed, these ports get placed inside just like any laparoscopic surgery. Then we put the position, patient with the head down, feet up in the air and then bring the robot in and the robot then gets docked over top of the patient this way. To access the target anatomy, the surgeon introduces the instruments through a series of small incisions. Again, these incisions are somewhere on the order of less than quarter of an inch to quarter of an inch in size. And compare that to what we used to do, making an incision that was maybe eight, 10 inches long. So you can imagine that just simply having smaller incisions translates into a lot less pain. These are the, the ports that are placed in, into the uh, patient's uh, abdomen. Okay, and so you can see that these are actually smaller than the traditional laparoscopic ports as well. These are only eight millimeter ports, uh, where some of the uh, traditional laparoscopic ports are, are 10 and 12 mil millimeter ports. And so this is what gets placed, and then these are specially designed to be able to dock right into the robot. A broad range of instrument types is available to help perform specialized surgical tasks with precision and control. Right now, 
there's no additional cost to the patient for having a da Vinci surgery versus having an open surgery versus having a minimally invasive surgery. So there's no additional cost to the patient. There's no additional cost to the insurance company. The hospital per case may actually uh, cost the hospitals a little bit more, but the hospitals uh, have decided that this is something that they want to do to give better quality of care to their patients. There are benefits to using the da Vinci surgical system when compared with traditional methods of surgery. The advantages are almost unanimously patient benefit. The patient has less scarring, less pain, recovers from the surgery a lot quicker. I tell them you recover in approximately half the time. It translates into lower costs in terms of being in the hospital. Patients are charged generally by the day, the amount of medicine that they take, the amount of care that they're given from, from a nursing standpoint. And the average stay from my radical prostatectomy done robotically is overnight home the next day. Home the next day. Sid, that's what everyone wants to hear, right? Absolutely. <laughs> with, with, uh, with robotic surgery. But uh, I, I wanted to uh, really talk with you. You're a vice president of clinical services for Baptist Hospital. And um, how does a hospital decide to invest in medical technology like the uh, Da Vinci surgical system? In other words, when do y'all make that decision? That's where we want to go. Great question, Bill. You know, I think some of, some of the benefits that you heard um, prior prior to, to asking me that question really, really come from the champions that are our physicians. You know, they, they came to us, for example, about three years ago and said, you know, there's this wonderful robot technology that's out there. It's going to do all of those things that, that you've already heard and, and, and make sure patients get home sooner and you know have less blood loss and less complications and we really want we've done our research we, we understand what it is and we want the hospital to partner with us and and make that available for us to do it so it's more of what your physician experts have researched and know will, will work versus a hospital administrator who may have no clue uh, you know how to how to work that equipment you know such as Dr. Bailey was talking about earlier so we really partner with them, listen to them. Certainly we do our due diligence and research um, you know, to see what those kinds of things may cost and what benefits may be out there. And three years ago, our, our physicians came and said, you know, we've got a lot of patients that are leaving our community um, because they've read about robotic surgery, uh, for example, for prostate cancer, and they, they really, you know, they're gonna leave town to, to have that done. So we need to make that available for our community. And that's how we made that decision in that particular case. So it's interesting, uh, you have uh, physicians that, that champion the, uh, the mm -hmm. new technology. Right. Now, what happens when you have a whole bunch of physicians and they have a whole bunch of technology that they want to uh, champion and uh, you have mm -hmm. to look at your capital expenditures, mm -hmm. how much can the hospital afford and how are those decisions made? Because can't those get into pretty dicey situations? when the ENT doctor has something that he wants and the, you know, the cardiac surgeon has some, all of them coming at mm -hmm. you at one time saying we want this new medical technology because we want it for the benefit of our patients. I, that is a, an even better question. <laughs> How do we deal with that? You know, our checkbook is like anybody's checkbook at home. You know, I can only afford to write a check personally uh, if I have money in the bank to do that. And, and same thing, you know, happens with hospitals as well. So. You know, I, I would like to step back and, and go to maybe a, a 50,000 foot view for a minute and say that, that most hospitals take a look at strategically what do they want to do and provide for the community, for example, the following budget year. And, you know, we do that in a lot of different ways. We poll our medical staff, we talk to all these doctors you just mentioned to see what's out there, what's new. Uh, you know, what's a replacement? You know, we're, we're talking tonight, I think, about new technology, but so much of the time, you know, expenses are, are there just to maintain what you currently have. So, you know, we poll them, we talk with our board of directors who, who you know, keep abreast of what the community might have questions about or might need or want. And we, and we have, have meetings with other community leaders to see what the interest is for that, you know, coming year and what strategies we might employ. Then we step that down another level to say, okay, what are we going to do next year? And that really drives what decisions are made. And then certainly we have medical staff committees. You know, you mentioned earlier, nothing, nothing happens in terms of decisions unless there's a committee involved sometimes. But, 
you know, we, we sit down with our group of physicians and they talk to each other and, and decide what's most important for that next year based on what strategies uh, are employed by the hospital. It's, it's sometimes not an easy discussion, um, but hopefully we, we make the best ones. And Dr. McCullough, if you um, have an institute, how do you make your decisions? Just, just a little additional insight. Mm -hmm. I've had a little bit of both of those experiences. I, have, I own a private medical center, and I've, of course, been on the technology side wanting new technology and my staff wanting new technology and also sitting there deciding whether or not we need to buy it. And it's sometimes a tough decision because we doctors have an insatiable appetite <laughs> for technology, and also it's a competitive situation. If the guy down the street or the hospital across town has it, you feel like you've got to have it in order to be competitive. So, so once again, um, it, it's something you have to work through and, and make sure that everybody understands, you know, why the robotic system was purchased before another piece of equipment. And um, hopefully um, the utilization will be high and, and, um, and, and the uh, surgeons will be able to use it for, uh, for the betterment of the patients. Oh, absolutely, and, and we actually have seen that, and we've just purchased our second one um, after, after uh, uh, three years of really continued utilization by se several groups of physicians. So it really has um, offered something that patients here needed. Well, Dr. Montgomery, we're going to kind of shift uh, focus here a little bit and, and talk about medical technology as it delays death to almost an unlimited period of time. And um, as you know, intensive care units can um, keep people alive for very long periods when maybe death is what, where they need to, to go. What, what, how, when, do, when do people need to let go and, and how is that determined typically in a hospital setting? Well, I can tell you it's ideally determined by looking at the patient's goals. Frequently we will have those in the form of, well, not as frequently as I would like, but we do get them in the form of a living will. The patient will tell us what they want for the, for the end of their life and how soon they want to let go. Sometimes the family doesn't always agree with this, but looking at the goal and also looking at what is possible. People may set a goal of cure when cure is not on the horizon and the only thing you can do is prolong the dying. And in those cases, uh, the advice to the patient and the family would be maybe it's time to let go but you really have to look at the patient's goals, the family's goals, and what is medically possible. So at some point, it, it, it goes away from the curative into the palliative, and, and, and tell us what those things mean and, and when that happens. Okay. Curative <clears throat> has a goal of cure of the patient, putting them back in whatever the best possible health they can, they can obtain. So the word curative means aiming for cure. Palliative has in mind a different set of goals. This is when a cure is not possible, and even improvement of the patient's condition is probably not possible. And what you do then is you aim for what the patient's goals are. Does he want to be alert enough to talk to his family? Does he want to be perfectly comfortable? Would he rather be mo more mobile? Does he want to quit chemotherapy because uh, He's, he's tired of going through whatever it was that he was going through, or does he not want any more surgery? You look at the patient's goals. When it's hard is if the patient is demented, and you hope, you hope against hope that that patient's family knows what that patient's wishes were before he lost his capacity to make decisions. And you alluded to advanced directives, um, yeah. living wills, and healthcare surrogates, and things like that. Um, uh, what are some of the, the issues that you see with families when people do not have those type of um, legal documents? What, what, what type of situations can happen? Well, you can really have bad situations when, for example, you have a, an elderly patient whose family has been taking loving care of them, except they have a daughter who lives in California who hasn't seen the patient in several years. And so the time is coming when this patient is... Uh, is really declining, not looking good, and that daughter will come in and say, uh, how dare you let my dad decline? How dare you neglect? The, ac the accusation is neglect. Uh, how dare you not do everything possible? Not everything that will achieve a goal, but everything possible. How dare you not do that? 
that's the sort of thing that you run into. But if you have a living will where the patient has clearly expressed their desires for the time when they can't express them themselves and that they do not want a particular procedure, they don't want a feeding tube, they don't want to be put on a ventilator, those sorts of things, then uh, it clarifies things for the family if we know that this is the patient's wishes. Uh, there, there is also the potential that the patient may say, by golly, I want everything under the sun. And that's also legit in a, li a living will. They can say, I do want or I don't want. And when you have this sort of document, it takes the stress and strain off the family trying to make the decisions for the patient and trying to explain to the family members who haven't been present during the whole course of the illness. Well, thank you, Dr. Montgomery. We appreciate you being here tonight. We do have some questions from our studio audience, and uh, Ann Bennett has a question, and it has to deal with research and development. And um, she uh, is very interested in, in I will, I'll let you ask the question, Ann, and, and maybe our audience can, can listen to you and then our panel can address. For me, it's been a matter of hearsay, but I have been given to understand that the research and development that is touted as one of the major costs for bringing these new technologies and drugs are actually performed at colleges and universities by graduate students that are working under grants and that a considerable percentage of these grants are actually tax funded. And I would like to know if that is an accurate statement and uh, whatever you answer me, I would like to know, is it hearsay to you or do you have actual knowledge? Thank you. All right, so uh, do you deal with that, Dr. Gilmore? Uh, Take a stab at this okay. one, yeah. Um, there is a, a very small proportion actually in the U.S. of um, research and development costs that are truly funded by uh, public dollars and by our government dollars. Most of the funding does come from private uh, investment. Now, the, the NIH, there are several groups within our, our um, government structure that do provide uh, a lot of funding through clinical trials and that sort of thing towards research and development costs. And once the dollars are divvied out, they typically go to academia and academic institutions. And the individuals who carry out the actual research can range from graduate students, graduate assistants, to uh, the principal investigator who is you know, t generally a tenured uh, professor at the university or, or you know, some clinician, someone with uh, clinical duties as well. So it really runs the gamut in terms of the individuals involved with the actual research and the, the number of sites involved. But in terms of the true investment dollars, it, it, uh, a smaller proportion certainly comes from our government, uh, you know, public dollars and public funding streams as compared to uh, the private funding streams of the, the pharmaceutical companies themselves. Okay, uh, Phil Woolley, you have a question, and uh, it's kind of a broad question, so I'm going to, you say, where is health care going? And that's as broad as you can get, but maybe you can uh, clarify it a little bit more. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you for being here tonight, members of the panel. Um, national health care is here, for better or for worse. In your estimation, as it ramps up through the industry, which areas of the medical field are going to be more receptive, if you will, to it? It lends itself to much more quicker acceptance. And because of national health care, how do you feel the training of men and women to be medical doctors will be impacted? Thanks very much. Well, does anyone have a, a good figure on um, if we have enough uh, medical doctors that are going to treat the 32 million that are going to be coming into the system in the next four or five years? No. We, no. Dr. We McCullough? We don't have enough physicians, and I think we're going to see a tremendous number of what's called physician extenders coming on board, uh, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, and other types of uh, programs that will be developed. Uh, many rural areas probably will not have a physician in the future, but will have a, a physician extender there. And in terms of, of what type of impact it's going to have on medical training, already we're involved at the University of Alabama with a pre-med program. And we're seeing many of the brightest and best students move into other fields. They, they think the best is behind us in medicine, unfortunately. I think we're going to see more foreign medical graduates uh, come into the field. And the medicine as we know it uh, is gone. And uh, we just hope that we can salvage something that will 
continue to resemble what we've experienced in the past, unfortunately. And, and I hate to be as blunt about it, but uh, I was told many years ago, if you like the efficiency of the postal system and the compassion of the Internal Revenue Service, you're going to love national health insurance. And so I'm afraid that we're in for some, some uh, shocking things in the future. You know, we, we started this uh, conversation talking about health care cost, and obviously um, President Obama, you know, signed the bill on March 23rd, the 2,400-page bill, <laughs> and uh, a lot of it had to do with um, health insurance reform, right, Todd? Exactly. And uh, so has this, this, this legislation at all started to look at trying to bend the curve on health care costs? Todd, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's our biggest concern, really, is you know, a lot of the provisions that are in the bill are favorable to consumers. Uh, a lot of things maybe that should have been done in the past, but the things we have most concerns about are the things that are not in the bill, and that's things that curtail the cost of medicine and reward the physicians and providers in the right way to get them to manage the cost of, of folks. So I, I agree with the doc here. I think we're going to see... Uh, a lot of change, and I think we're going to see the cost of uh, medicine go up and the cost of our insurance go up. I had a, a question here, and I let's see. Uh, I'm gonna, well, I tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and, and let our cancer person handle this one because uh, this one wasn't signed. But um, a doctor says, "What are your thoughts on early detection of cancer? Um, are we spending enough money in that area? In other words, are we spending more money on the backside treating cancer?" where maybe we could catch it early on if we had more detection going on. Are we spending enough money in that arena? The three more co most common malignancies that uh, we commonly look for or try to uh, catch early are breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer. And in this country, uh, there's been a lot of controversy about uh, what's the right age group and what's the cost of uh, screening these individuals. Let's take breast cancer, for instance. Uh, it's uh, common in the United, in United States to start, start mammographies at 40. However, in uh, Canada and other countries, they do not do that. They don't do it until 50. So 40 to 50 age group, if they are not offered mammographies, obviously you're going to miss some cancers. But the cost of doing mammographies in that age group, um, it, that's where the debate starts to come in, that uh, is the cost worth preventing and, and uh, saving some lives in there? In the United States, we tend to do them from 40 to 50 age group, but uh, in Canada and other European countries, they don't. Uh, same thing about colonoscopies. Um, we start doing colonoscopies at age 50 onwards. Now, uh, you may have, you know, President Obama, for instance, recently underwent uh, a health exam, and he went through colonoscopy and uh, PSA screening and so forth, and there was a major controversy about it that why should he have these preventative measures when he, uh, these are not the guidelines. He should not have had a colonoscopy. He should not have had a PSA exam. And the point is that in the United States, we are doing a lot of screening, but the controversy has started to creep into the system that maybe we are overdoing too much. And, uh, and maybe the cost is not worth the amount of lives that are being saved. And I think that's where the attention is going. Now, with the uh, new legislation, won't Medicare recipients be able to um, have uh, yes. no co-pays yes. for, for the treatment for these uh, screenings? Yes, and that's appropriate because that will translate into saving lives. Okay. Um, this is another uh, term that was uh, kicked around during the, the health care reform debate, and uh, it's called comparative effectiveness. And um, this question has to do, can the research be used to evaluate insurance coverage and reimbursement issues? And uh, does anybody want to take uh, the, what is comparative effectiveness and maybe talk a little bit about it? And is it going to be, as they do more and more research, a, um, a determination whether insurance coverage or reimbursement is, um, is, is an issue? You look, okay. Yeah, uh, I'll take Dr. that Dr. Gilmore. Um, I've been in D.C. a few times, actually, in the last couple of months. Um, discussing this issue and, and uh, attending several conferences on comparative effectiveness. Um, comparative effectiveness is really trying to compare uh, two alternative treatments or two alternative diagnostic modalities that are used uh, to treat the same condition or the same, uh, the same uh, type of event in a patient. And 
what we have right now, especially in the drug world, is uh, for a drug to be uh, approved by the FDA, it only has to be efficacious and safe compared to a placebo, not to another drug that might be the standard of care at a given time. And so this whole idea of comparative effectiveness is to know what works best for which patient, not just what works. Um, and so it's been given a lot of attention. And in the new healthcare bill, there's actually a new institute, a government institute that was going to uh, be, well, it will be funded by the government um, and sort of be not uh, housed within any of our current government uh, organizations, but it will be called the Patient Centered uh, Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI is what it's starting to be called, that is really going to be engaging in and, and spearheading this effort of comparative effectiveness. And right now, um, under the current uh, wording and language of the bill, um, there will be no uh, linkage, direct linkage to reimbursement, either for Medicare or any of the other uh, publicly funded payers, but um, all of the, uh, all the speculation is that it will lead there and it will certainly inform uh, coverage-related and reimbursement-related decisions. So is this a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> I think it's a very good thing because I think we need to know what works best for which patient. I think where, it can, where we have to be very, very careful is um, creating blanket decisions for all patients um, and there is no average patient. There might still be patients on the edges who might benefit from a certain treatment, and what we have to be very careful about is making sure those patients still have access to certain treatments that may not have won the game of comparative effectiveness at a, at a very high level. Because so. some people snicker about um, cookbook medicine. You know, right. everybody right. has to apply, and you're, you're saying that there's still individuals that may fall out of, you know, the, uh, the, the, the best practice type of Right, approach. exactly, and, and I think what where comparative effectiveness needs to go hand in hand with our personalized medicine movement in terms of, of really trying to determine the exact treatment that each patient needs, um, and that, that will mean designing our trials differently, designing our studies differently, um, but hopefully that's where it will be headed in terms of giving us that best information and giving all the practitioners what they need as well to know uh, what works best for which patient. All right, Ann Bennett, you have another question. It's about salaries. and. Uh... I guess, you know, once again, there's going to be some people that take hits, and I guess you'll ask your question. I'm not sure if this panel is making any big salaries, but we'll see what she has to say. Well, my questions were primarily about the pharmaceutical and equipment companies, which I understood was the topic. But my understanding is that the CEOs and upper-level managements of some of these corporations get absolutely outrageous reimbursed or, or salaries and perks and stock options and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering how much effect that actually has on what we pay. Oh, goodness gracious. Todd, the insurance industry. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then you hear about an HMO president making a lot of money. Um, you know, does that all trickle down to the, the costs? When you have to go and deal with that business owner, and get their employees signed up for a health care plan. Do you ever think about how much the guy at the top is making? On occasion, it crosses my mind. <laughs> but uh, it's just like any other industry. You have to compensate top talent to run a good organization. And these are multi-billion dollar companies. And to run them effectively and to grow and to drive the innovation that's needed to get to the next level with medical technology or whatever the business is, um, you're going to have to attract that kind of talent. And um, I wish there were more of us that could, could reach that level. Uh, this one uh, has to do with insurance coverage. And actually, it's for you, Dr. McCulloch. Uh, this person has had a hard time breathing through their nose for a while, and they don't feel like it, it's allergy or sinus problems. It may be a, a problem with the nose itself. Um, a facial plastic surgery, normally not covered by insurance. Are, are people able to uh, present and, um, and be able to get coverage through their insurance? Some procedures are covered. As a matter of fact, nasal surgery is one of the uh, few procedures that, that is covered, particularly if there is a problem breathing through the nose. Uh, a deviated nasal septum, which is a central partition in the middle of the nose, if it's crooked and, and is shifted to one side or the other and blocks the airway, can lead to chronic sinus infection, it is the most common curable causes, cause of headaches in the country. Uh, it's amazing how many people are treated for years for migraine headaches and nobody ever looked at their septum and you correct the nasal septum and the headaches either go away or become less frequent, less severe, reduces the amount of medications, time away from work. When you look at the overall cost of headaches in America and a deviated septal repair can correct that and the insurance companies do participate 
in the functional or the reconstructive portion of nasal surgery. They will not pay for the cosmetic portion, such as removing the bump on the nose or narrowing the nose, but they do uh, reimburse for a large part of the operation. Thank you. Dr. Bailey, this is, um, you mentioned uh, minimally invasive surgery, and uh, what, what are some of the things being used with cardiothoracic surgery? You may have alluded to them. Is it valve work that's current? What's, what's happening now in, well, in your area? You know, minimally invasive surgery can be used for uh, bypass surgery, for you know, uh, unblocking blockage or bypassing blocked vessels. Although that's not the primary uh, role for minimally invasive surgery, probably the most effective area is mitral valve surgery, in particular mitral valve repair. Uh, the mitral valve sits in a, in a location in the chest where it's actually directed backwards. So in order to approach the valve through the front, which would be the standard approach to uh, the heart, uh, the valve is very hard to see and it's, it's difficult to repair those valves in that way. So there are techniques where a two and a half inch long incision can be made and the valve be viewed uh, on FOSS where you see the entire valve in one field of view and you can more effectively repair that valve or more likely repair that valve and patients generally recover fairly quickly. There are some, there is some chest wall pain after surgery because you are going through muscles but uh, the pain is, is short lived and I see folks back in the office two weeks after surgery and they ask me what their restrictions are and I, I really can't come up with any at that point because we have not disrupted the, the chest skeleton. Uh, and that, that's probably the most effective role for minimally invasive heart surgery. Well, we're down to uh, our, our last two minutes here and getting ready to leave. And, and this last question really dealt with uh, there should there be some type of health technology assessment or, or some, you know, super way that you can come in and look at new technology and bless it or not bless it. And is that in the future cards as we try to control this rising health care cost? Uh, Sid, you got about 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds to answer yeah. that. But once again, you're at clinical services, yeah, so you're no, dealing absolutely. with it all the time. Um, I, I can't speak for the country, but certainly for our facility, we do have what we call a clinical value analysis team, and that's a group of experts, physicians, and others that do look at technology, try to assess, you know, is it better than what we currently have? Is it something that we need to do? And, you know, how do we need to approach that? So I, I believe every, every hospital might do that differently. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for being part of this program tonight. We do appreciate you all coming out and being with us. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for joining us for this town hall meeting on medical technology. For additional information, visit our website. That's uh, WSRE.org. Uh, we'll see you next time on Inside Healthcare. If you would like to be a part of the Inside Healthcare studio audience or would like to view previous editions of the program, visit wsre.org slash health. This comprehensive website has links to local and national resources and is part of WSRE's Community Health Initiative, helping the people of the Gulf Coast to become better equipped with the knowledge and tools to manage their own health. That's wsre.org slash health.